So let's revisit some of the elements of the nerve impulse. Starting on plate 16, control of ion channels by membrane potential. So when I talked about proteins, transmembrane proteins responding to the electrical events of an action potential, I said there was a, a, a conformational change. Um, the status of these transmembrane proteins, that is the size of the pores, their ability to transport compounds in an action, in an action potential, in a nerve or axon, is under a huge amount of electrical control. That is, the change of these proteins respond to changes in electrical activity, what we call voltage gates. So if you look uh, on plate 16, we talk about the, the, um, this concept of gates opening and closing. And uh, in the, uh, uh, so in a normal cell, This, the gate on this transprotein channel is relatively shut or closed. So all the sodium is kept on the extracellular side and very little gets in through this channel. When the membrane is stimulated, there is a depolarization characterized by an opening of the gate and a movement of sodium into the cell. Cell becomes relatively positive compared to the resting cell. That positive charge on the inside influences this gate and closes the gate. So it is a voltage-gated channel. Let's turn to plate 17 and consider the ionic basis for threshold, all or none response, and refractory periods. So there, there are a couple characteristics of a nerve cell. It has a resting membrane potential of minus 70. Well, that's not, that's not distinguishing because all cells have a negative potential. It is unique in having an action potential. There is a threshold for this, that is a minimal stimulus to produce an action potential. We can do this with electrical shocks, we can do it with temperature, we can do it with osmotic, we can do it with changing salt concentrations. Uh, historically, what, what neurophysiologists would do is hook up a battery, a battery with a variable voltage, and they would change the voltage and, and look for the occurrence of an action potential. And they would increase the voltage, and at one point then, they would find there would be a minimal voltage necessary to elicit the response. Meaning that the cell would, with, without adequate stimulation, the cell is quiescent. It's not sending a signal. One of the problems in hyperexcitable states is the threshold for this nerve gets lowered. So the meaning that the cell will respond to smaller and smaller stimuli, making the cell much more excitable. Well, in the same fashion, you don't want the cell never to respond. Having too much response can also be a bad thing. So we want some kind of threshold. We want the cell to require an adequate stimulus in order for it to produce this action potential. What I should say is that when this was done in the lab, oftentimes the electrical stimulus was done in the cell body and the recording of the action potential was done on the axon. And in fact, we do not see the occurrence of an action potential until we get to this zone that connects the body with the axon. 
So we don't record real action potentials here. We only record them here. So part of that stimulus, that threshold stimulus, is the amount of stimulus that you need to induce, the amount of electrical change that you need to induce in the cell body that gets transmitted down to the axon. So you have a threshold. You need a minimal amount. Well, once the stimulus at this point is adequate to create an action potential, a second characteristic of an action potential is that it is all or none, meaning you get the action potential or you don't. So if you're sitting there recording at the axon, if the voltage isn't high enough, you get an action, you don't get any action potential. But if the stimulus is increased beyond threshold, you see an action potential, but if you increase the voltage even more, you don't see a greater action potential. So what is setting the magnitude of the action potential are those voltage gates. For each action potential, you have a little bit of sodium rushing in and a little bit of potassium out. The magnitude of these ion fluxes are very local and have essentially no effect on the concentration gradients. There are calculations that in order to change the concentration gradient significantly, you'd have to stimulate that axon 20,000 times while the sodium potassium pump was poisoned. All right, so we're talking about very minute changes, but they occur very rapidly. Um, uniformed uniform direction. What happens in an axon in a normal functioning nerve cell is that the electrical stimulation starts in the cell body. So there is information coming into the dendrites that cause an electrical change in the cell body transmitted to this region of the axon and the action potential starts here. The local occurrence of electrons and electron flow cause a slight depolarization in the areas on either side of the action potential. But since the action potential is starting here, it propagates or moves in this direction. So if you think about the, you know, the, the, the potential starting here and causing a little bit of change right next to it, and it makes that portion of the axon more susceptible, it reaches threshold, that then this area becomes an action potential. And then that area stimulates and the action potential moves. So we have a unidirectional propagation of the action potential in a normal functioning cell. Now I will tell you that historically what was done is characteristically these cells were taken out and the electrical stimulation was occurred mid-axon and they would record here, and they would record here. In this circumstance, when the stimulus is here, action potentials propagate in both directions. Huh. Well, if that's the case, why, when you get a stimulus here, coming from the cell body, does the action potential only propagate in one direction? That has to do with the refractory period. So down in the bottom left, it shows you the action potential. We have the resting potential at minus 70 right here. There is a stimulus, which is labeled number 2. 
so they've connected a battery and they've given this axon a little stimulus. But this stimulus isn't sufficient to reach this threshold. That is, a, an electrical signal that opens up the gates. So you, no response. However, if the electrical stimulus is sufficient so that it depolarizes, it opens up the sodium gates, sodium rushes in, when it becomes very positive, electrical gates shut for sodium and open for potassium. Potassium rushes out, causing it to become more negative, and then it overshoots. And so in this zone that I've kind of highlighted here in, in um, yellow is this hyperpolarization zone. Well, if the cell is hyperpolarized, it's down here at minus 80, and I need to get to minus 60 to get a action potential, then that action, that nerve requires more stimulus to get an action potential. That is, it, that cell is what we call refractory. So if someone calls you refractory, that means that you aren't being responsive. It takes much more stimulus for a refractory cell to respond than a normal cell. Well, what that means is that in our axon, under normal circumstances, the action potential starts here. It moves in this direction. So when the action potential is here, this zone is where the action potential has already occurred, and it is in this hyperpolarization. So this is then the refractory. That means action potential signaling can only be done by modulation or changes in the frequency. We only get one action potential moving down the axon. It's all or none, so the magnitude of it doesn't change. So the only way we can modulate or change the signal is changing the frequency at which these action potentials occur and travel down the axon. Go to plate 18. Transmission of the nerve impulses. Squid giant axon is very, very large. One millimeter in, in diameter. It is also a singular cell. Most of the cells in our body most of our nerve cells, the, the axons are associated with a lipid layer a, uh, derived from a separate cell, the Schwann cell, that contains large amounts of a lipid compound called myelin. So there's a nice diagram in your notes here of myelin. Here's a central axon, so this is the nerve cell, the actual neuron, and it has associated itself with this cell right here, which has a nucleus, and it wraps itself around the axon, and contained within it is this, these layers or sheets of myelin. Myelin is lipid. It is an insulator. And we're going to see how that works in a second. But first, let's talk about non-myelinated. So here's the non-myelinated axon. This would be a classic example of the squid axon. Once stimulated, the impulse propagates or moves along the entire length. And a 
in the, in the fashion kind of demonstrated down here. So here's the, here's the resting cell. Action potential travels, and in this diagram, the action potential is occurring right here. And you can see the gates have opened. This is extracell, intracell. Sodium rushes in. This sodium will tend to make the cell more positive. That is, it tends to depolarize. Remember, that's we are getting depolarization of the threshold. In the, in the portion of the axon immediately to this side, it hasn't seen an action potential. That is, the tissue isn't refractory. So this little change in current right here causes an opening of the gate here, and you see that, sodium, that now this sodium channel. So that's what we talk about propagating, moving from here to here to here to here to here. Now, immediately in the zone that it has come from, right? So the action potential started here, moved in this direction. Well, this area immediately behind it is in that hyperpolarized zone. That is, it's refractory. That means that, that cell is not, or that portion of the, of the axon is not going to respond. So you will not see it, the generation of an action potential there. All in non-myelin. Well, how do we do, what do we do with myelin? Well, first of all, why have, my, why have uh, myelin at all? Larger axons conduct more rapidly, faster movement, less resistance. You become an electrician, big wire, better. More expensive, but better. Squid. Not particularly bright, you know, don't need a lot of axons. What if you are a human and you want to have lots of neurons? Well, you can't have them all big. Okay? Um, size limitations. So how can we make neurons conduct very, very rapidly, but have them to be very, very small? Well, that's where we see the advent of the Schwann cell and myelin. Diagram does a good job of describing the relationship of these cells to the axon. So in fact, each nerve axon has lots of myelin in it. Sorry, the better way of saying that. Lots, each axon has lots of Schwann cells. So if you see this little diagram here, each of those little protuberances is a Schwann cell with myelin, separated by a short space named after a French anatomist called Ranvier. So these are the nodes of nodes of Ranvier. Great because it insulates. Secondly, it forces the action potential to jump from node to node. That is, these areas are all insulated, so you don't see the movement, right? Here you, here's your sodium ion out here. It really only has access to that node. And that's demonstrated in the bottom figure. So this is, a, this is a, a longitudinal section. There's the axon right here. Each of these represents a Schwann cell. There is periodic punctuation with spaces of no Schwann cell. These are the nodes of Ranvier. It's these places that are the ones that have access to the sodium. So in fact, you will only measure action potentials at the nodes. So instead of in a non-myelinated fiber, action potentials occur along the entire length. In myelinated fibers, 
action potentials only occur at the nodes of Ranvier. And what happens is there is a jumping of the action potential. And you can see these, these kind of little arrows showing you that an action potential occurs here and then it jumps very rapidly to right here. That is referred to as saltatory conduction or jumping. Uh, in your notes, nodes are, are about one to two millimeters apart. I, those numbers aren't important. It's just to tell you that you must have these nodes in order for it to occur. What happens when the myelin disappears? So here's a, here's a clinical correlate, and if you look on, on plate 18, it talks about uh, uh, multiple sclerosis, guillain barre syndrome, which is a demyelinating disease. Loss of the Schwann cells, loss of this demyelination. Well, what's going to happen to nerve conduction impulses? The presence of myelin makes this a very rapid process. When you lose the myelin, you now must propagate the action potential along the entire length. That slows it down and can, in fact, produce a blockage. So these individuals lose their ability. If this axon is going to a muscle, that muscle is going to lose the speed of, of stimulus. It takes much longer for that stimulus to get there. Uh, in, in the notes, the is illustrated by the calculation showing that if fast conducting mammalian axons had to perform the same job without their sheaths, they would have to be 38 times larger. Right? So what we've done with myelination is we've really reduced this, the size of it, and yet we've been able to maintain a very rapid speed. Loss of that myelin uh, leads to a loss of function. Synaptic transmission. If I'm going to draw my nerve cell, here's the cell body, the axonal projection, and the terminal axon. I talked about the dendrites. Dendrites are projections from the cell body that receive information. The synapse is where the axon terminal communicates with another cell. In some cases, these are other neurons. So this synapse would be between axon and dendrite. So I might draw another cell here. So here's the cell body, here's the axonal projection, there's the axon terminus, there's a synapse, a connection between this axon and this axon. Synapses can occur between nerve muscles, uh, between nerve cells and muscle cells. We talked about a neuromuscular junction. So that synapse then is between axon nerve and muscle. How does an action potential, an electrical event, get translated from one cell, whether it be axon, well, from one cell, from one axon to another cell, whether it be another axon or whether it be muscle? That is what is referred to as synaptic transmission. And while uh, you can be a little smug, uh, you might imagine uh, nerdy scientists going to great arguments about the means of this transmission. There was a a division of the soups and the sparks. Soups believed that it was a chemical transmission of information from one cell to the other. The sparks believed that it, in fact, was an electrical signal. And uh, there was, uh, you know, as might you expect in the scientific world, a huge controversy as scientists are off uh, to generate. What we know is that, in fact, it occurs both ways. The primary means of synaptic transmission, however, is chemical. 
So the chemical transmission. So let's, let's look at the synapse in a little more detail. And there's a good picture right here in your notes. Let's don't rotate it that way. So, cell body up here, axonal projection coming down, and there's the, the, um, the axon terminus, sometimes referred to as the synaptic bouton or synaptic button. On EMs, this is an enlarged structure at the terminus. And it is characterized by the presence of mitochondria and lots of vesicles or organelles that contain chemicals. In early EM work, what they would do is they would take a non-stimulated neuromuscular junction, do an EM stain on it, fix it and do an EM stain on it. Then they would take another prep and they would stimulate the, the nerve till exhaustion, uh, fix it and, and stain it. And in that case, they would find reduced numbers of these vesicles. So I said, ah, I bet you these vesicles all contain chemicals. Chemicals which are released to communicate from one cell to the next. So this synaptic bouton occurs on one side of the synaptic cleft. So we can refer to this as the presynaptic neuron. And this is the presynaptic membrane. We have the synaptic cleft, and then we have a postsynaptic cell and a postsynaptic membrane. So the question is, how does the information get from presynapse to postsynapse? In this particular diagram, they've diagrammed a synaptic junction between axon and dendrite. So the dendrite is the postsynaptic membrane. The first element of this is the action potential coming down, being propagated down the axon. When it reaches the synaptic terminus, the presynaptic membrane, this membrane has channels in it for another ion, namely calcium. So we've said uh, you need to know sodium, you need to know potassium, you need to know chloride, where they're high in concentration. Now we need to add in calcium. So calcium is high extracellular. So if I go back and draw my little diagram of my cell, the cell has large amounts of potassium in it relative to the extra cell. Extra cell, large amounts of sodium relative to the inside. Chloride, more on the outside than on the inside. And calcium divalent cation. So now I have a diffusional gradient for calcium. It hasn't played any role in the action potential, right? Action potential is strictly sodium and potassium. Now what I'm going to do is introduce another ion gate, another voltage gated channel, a channel in the presynaptic membrane which in response to an action potential to a depolarization opens. The calcium, which is high on the outside, diffuses in. This calcium the increase in calcium on the inside is responsible then for the release of this chemical. We're going to call this chemical a neurotransmitter. Right, it's transmitting the neural information. So calcium is the stimulus for this neurotransmitter. It's a chemical. 
one of the most common examples of a neurotransmitter, the most common. Acetylcholine. Well, I'm, I'm getting less of the tan, I see. Acetylcholine. The most prolific neurotransmitter in our body. There's others, serotonin, dopamine, uh, GABA, some of which we'll come back and talk about in a little more detail. But for the, the purposes of this, we'll just pretend this is acetylcholine. So this is our neurotransmitter. It's a chemical. It is a chemical that is lodged in vesicles inside the presynaptic membrane. The calcium causes it to move, the membrane, the vesicles to move and fuse and disgorge the calcium, or excuse me, the neurotransmitter. And you, you see that right here in this little vesicle, that it's spewing forth its chemicals. These chemicals are moving on a concentration gradient. They're very high inside the vesicle. They're very low relative on the outside. So, in fact, the movement of these neurotransmitters is by simple diffusion. One of the arguments was, how can chemicals possibly diffuse rapidly enough to affect changes so rapid uh, that characterize the nervous system? So, what we see, in fact, is very, very limited diffusional distances. This synaptic cleft is only angstroms apart, so they're very close. It doesn't have to diffuse very far and can do it rapidly in the order of milliseconds. The chemical then is released. It diffuses across to the postsynaptic membrane. In the postsynaptic membrane, the neurochemical, the neurotransmitter, binds to a receptor. And that's noted here. So a critical component of the response of the postsynaptic cell is having a receptor which is specific for that neurotransmitter. If you don't have the receptor, you do not have a functional postsynaptic membrane. It just won't see the neurotransmitter. So to have a functional nerve and neurotransmission, we've got to have calcium. We've got to have calcium channels. Calcium channels, uh, we need to have vesicles with neurotransmitter in it. We need to have receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. If a failure anywhere along that line, you're going to lose function of the postsynaptic cell. Some ion channels produce excitation. So that's this right up here. And excitatory, let's move this over a bit, and excitatory postsynaptic potential, or EPSP. All right, so break that down. It's a potential, it's a change in electrical activity in the postsynaptic membrane, and it is one that is likely to produce an action potential, so it's excitatory. What did we need for a action potential? We needed a slight depolarization. How did we do that? Well, in action potential, we change the, 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 the sodium channels. We see exactly the same thing in an excitatory postsynaptic potential. The neurotransmitter goes across, it binds to a receptor, and a conformational change occurs, opening this channel up a bit and allowing sodium to flow in on a concentration gradient. So just like in an action potential, we see this movement of sodium in, and it depolarizes or stimulates the postsynaptic membrane. These can also be inhibitory. An inhibitory postsynaptic potential does just the opposite. An IPSP is a condition in which the neurotransmitter goes and binds to a compound, which changes the permeability not to sodium, 
but to other chemicals. And in this case, it increases the permeability to potassium. So which way does potassium? Potassium diffuses out. So that makes the inside of the cell more negative. It may also increase permeability for chloride. Chloride's high outside, so chloride may move in. That makes it even more negative. So instead of going from minus 70 to, mi to minus 60, it may go from minus 70 to minus 90. That means there's a bigger difference across the membrane. That means that membrane is hyperpolarized. So in the same fashion that we said action potentials produce a hyperpolarization in a refractory period, here is an example in which a chemical, a neurotransmitter, makes the postsynaptic membrane less sensitive. It inhibits, it makes this membrane more refractory. Different synapses, different transmitters. So on any one axon, we can have cells, neurons that are impinging and are providing excitatory postsynaptic potentials and cells which are providing inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. The final outcome of that cell is going to be a function of how much inhibition and how much excitation. So think of the system as on kind of all the time. So you've got some excitatory input, some inhibitory input. You can inhibit the cell by turning up the inhibitory, by turning down the excitatory, or doing both. Um, action of neurotransmitter does not act for very long. So implicit in this is you need some way to turn off an, a, uh, an action potential. And so we're going, we're going to talk about that in the, use the neuromuscular synapse as an example. So if we go to plate 20 and look at the neuromuscular synapse, we're looking at a specific synapse of axon and non-axon, or muscle tissue. So here's your diagram again of the, uh, this, is, this is the terminal synapse. So here's the synapse right here. These are the vesicles that are filled with the neurotransmitter. You need to know that the neurotransmitter for the neuromuscular junction is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is an excitatory neurotransmitter, so it produces an excitatory postsynaptic potential. Made up of acetate, so acetic acid, pretty simple and then a larger choline molecule. Acetate and choline are combined together in the neuron, synthesized in the neuron to produce acetylcholine, and then acetylcholine is shipped out. Well, where, is, where are these processes occurring? Most of the, the metabolism is occurring up in the cell body. So acetylcholine is made up in the cell body. It's transported down the axon into these vesicles down here in the synapse. You now have these, you now have these compounds uh, that are locked in the vesicle. They are held by um, a protein matrix. One of the protein is actin. Actin, as we will see later, is a key player in muscle contraction. That is a protein involved in movement. So we now start seeing, well, you know, we've talked about diffusion. We now may be talking about protein mediated transport, proteins that are involved in transporting things from one to the other. So there are these actin molecules, actin we know, we know are involved in contraction, and another protein called synapsin 
in the figure, these, these little circles here. So this, uh, the, the role of synapsin and actin is to hold these vesicles in reserve. That is, they're waiting for a stimulus to release. There are other vesicles that have moved into position on the presynaptic membrane, and these are held by specific proteins called docking proteins or snares. This is not a helter-skelter. This is not a, a, a random occurrence. In order to get normal function, you need to have these docking proteins present. Without these docking proteins, this vesicle will not bind to the presynaptic membrane. So, an increase in calcium uh, calcium comes in and you get stimulus of release of these vesicles that move to the presynaptic. They bind to the docking proteins and release the acetylcholine, a process of exocytosis. One can read that, you're better than me. Exocytosis. So the binding of, of this membrane, fusion, the membranes then open up, you have a conduit into the synaptic cleft, and you have the movement of acetylcholine based on its concentration gradient across the synaptic cleft. So here's the synaptic cleft, you've had fusion, here's the acetylcholine coming out. It diffuses across to the postsynaptic membrane where there are receptors, specific receptors for acetylcholine in response to the binding of these acetylcholine and to the receptors you get a conformational change in the in the ports for sodium and you get a depolarization you need to turn it off you've got acetylcholine out there it continues to bind and release from the receptors so it continues to stimulate the compound that's responsible for turning that off is an enzyme which is located in the synaptic cleft which breaks down acetylcholine into acetate and choline. And that compound is called acetylcholine esterase. So it takes acetylcholine and it breaks it into acetate and choline. Neither of which can stimulate the receptors, right? The receptor is specific for this molecule and this molecule alone. So once the acetylcholine esterase inactivates the acetylcholine, the nerve impulse, the, the postsynaptic response is shut off. In order to continue to maintain a postsynaptic stimulus, you must have another action potential coming down the presynapse. So one signal comes down, you just got one release of acetylcholine, and you get a single twitch of the muscle. You want that muscle to stay on for a longer period of time, what must you do? You must send more acetylcholine and more action potentials down. Remember, all or none, so you can increase the magnitude of the action potential. You can't make the, the active potential twice the size and get twice the release of acetylcholine. So the only way we are able to modulate the, the, acetyl, the amount of uh, acetylcholine coming across to the muscle is by increasing or by changing the frequency of the action potential. If I want the motor nerve to be, if I want the muscle to be off, I shut the action potentials off. If I want them to be active, I increase them. Um, Neurotransmitter is reclaimed. Uh, acetate is relatively cheap energetically. Choline is very expensive, so there's recycling that occurs, uh, reuptake of, the, of, of the, the choline. And that is with a so sodium-mediated co-transport. 
So we talk about calcium transport for vesicle release. Sodium transport in is coupled to choline reuptake. Okay? Toxicology. So what we're going to do is we're going to go in clinically and we're going to, we're going to screw this system up. And one of the best ways to upset the neuromuscular junction is by the use of organophosphates, right? Malathion. Wonderful in the treatment of insects. Great for insect control, particularly for ectoparasites. So we use it, uh, we use it commercially in agricultural uh, commodities, uh, agricultural settings. It's used topically. So the next time you're in, in, a, in a store, I want you to go and, and look in the, uh, in the pet section, pick up some flea repellent and read the label. Invariably, it will be some compound like 3 orthohydroxy epipara and you recognize that that's some kind of organic compound. It's most likely an organophosphate. So organophosphates. Well, organophosphates operate by inhibiting acetylcholine esterase. So if you have a compound which inhibits acetylcholine esterase, that is going to potentiate the presence of acetylcholine. It's like super stimulating. So in fact, one of the clinical signs of cats and dogs with organophosphate poisoning is fasciculations or twitching. You've inhibited the acetylcholine esterase so that simple nerve action potentials now have much more heightened response. And a heightened response that, that can be relatively uncontrollable. So these animals have difficulty in moving, their muscles may be fasciculating or contracting right before your eyes. There are other elements that are, that are modulated by acetylcholine. Salivation. Uh, lacrimation. Urination and defecation. So in the presence of an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, these animals also permit, permit or present with saliva. They kind of look like the rabid dog, right? They got really active and they got saliva coming down. There may be tearing or lacrimation, uncontrollable urination and uncontrollable defecation. That's also the clinical signs of people involved in uh, pet shops that help with the dipping. Every once in a while, I'll get something from a uh, uh, public health memo talking about number of vet techs who have been uh, presented with organic phosphate poisoning. So you're dipping these animals in this organophosphate. If you don't have adequate protection, you're going to absorb it through your skin and can acquire Excessive fasciculation, salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation. The classic example uh, in which it was uh, demonstrated by your own university veterinarian was when I was out trapping crown squirrels. And so we had a, a study involved with the uh, uh, with with ground squirrel muscle function. We wanted these animals fresh from the field. They also came with ectoparasites on them. We didn't want them coming into the lab with ectoparasites, so. I used an organophosphate. Went over to the clinic. The only organophosphate that I could find was for use in cows. Now, I know. I'm a trained professional. Cows have skin that is hugely thick. And the concentrations of organophosphate are very, very high. But, yeah. I'm a scientist. I know that if I use small amounts of this organophosphate, I will not have a problem. So I sprayed just a little eensy, teensy, tiny bit on this little ground squirrel, at which point it started salivating, defecating and urinating, and running around in its cage. And I knew immediately that I had 
organophosphate poison this animal. So the treatment is in fact very fast, very effective. Uh, you have absorbed it. If you are continually presenting yourself, you want to wash it off. So uh, that squirrel got its first shampoo, I think, ever. And then in addition, we give atropine. Atropine counteracts the effects of organophosphates. So it decreases muscle activity. It decreases salivation, lacrimation, urination, and defecation. Atropine is also one of the number one pre-surgical treatment drugs. Why? Well, during surgery, you don't want a lot of muscle activity. You don't want saliva, particularly if you're passing an endotrach tube. Lacrimation, you may be more or less uh, ambivalent about, but it's also nice not to have them urinate and defecate on the surgical table. So we see atropine, common compound used to counteract the effects of, of organophosphate poisoning. What else? Botulinum toxin. So next time you're in the store, you see a, a can of chilies, and it looks a little poofy. So instead of being recessed, it looks a little enlarged with gas. And particularly if you open it and you feel this rush of gas come out, uh, it would be best not to ingest any of that. Clostridium is an anaerobic organism. Lots of clostridia in the world. The most potent one is Clostridium botulinum. So this organism produces a toxin called botulin, which gram per gram is one of the most potent neurotoxins extant. It acts by blocking these docking proteins. So if we go down and look here at some of these pathologies, there's botulinum toxin. Degrades the docking proteins. Well, no, you no know, docking proteins, you can have lots of acetylcholine but it doesn't get released. So the action potentials are coming down, no acetylcholine. Now, organophosphates accentuated. They potentiated. This is just the opposite. It stops the acetylcholine. Well, no acetylcholine, no excitation of the, of the muscle. And unfortunately, one of, the, one of the main skeletal muscles involved in living is your diaphragm. So without, and that's how, that's how you die from botulinum toxin. The diaphragm stops contracting, you suffocate. Black widow venom. Black widow venom causes a total excitosis. So there is a, a a massive release of acetylcholine. So clinically, you would see all of these signs of, of excess acetylcholine. Uh, salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, a lot of muscle fasciculations. But once all that acetylcholine had been released and the acetylcholine esterase took it all away, you'd have no more left in the presynaptic membrane. So the action potentials would come down nothing to release. So like botulinum, black widow venom affects, produces a, a paralysis. A number of nerve gases and poisons can keep the synaptic cleft flooded with neurotransmitters and it's super excitable. Curare. All right, so there you are in the wilds of Brazil. You're getting kind of hungry. You see monkey meat up in the trees. 
you say, well, how can I get those monkeys down there pretty fast? So you see the natives boiling the little, little brightly colored frogs in over the, over the fire and then dipping their arrow tips into the broth. Then shooting the monkey, the monkey slows down and eventually falls out of the tree. So our kind of pharmacopoeia of curare, uh, poison arrow frogs or dendrobated frogs are, are, are one of the natural sources for this. Curare, which is produced by these frogs, blocks acetylcholine receptors. So like um, botulinum toxin, there's no post-synaptic response. However, totally different mechanism. In this one, there's lots of acetylcholine, but there are no functional receptors. The receptors have been blocked by the curare. Tetrodotoxin. So there you are in chef school in Japan. You're in the Northern Island. You're learning from one of the masters and they bring in a puffer fish. And if you don't prepare this adequately, you will not eliminate the tetrodotoxin. Tetrodotoxin is a potent sodium channel blocker. So that's going to influence reuptake of choline and an eventual loss of acetylcholine. The net effect will be paralysis. So you see that most of these compounds, most of these, most of these chemical poisons, act by decreasing the amount of acetylcholine. Or they decrease the effect of the acetylcholine. There's one in your notes that I don't want to, that uh, there's one that's not in your notes that I want to talk about, and that is Maya Sthenia gravis. Maya meaning muscle, sthenia meaning uh, sensation or response. Gravis is grave or bad. Myasthenia gravis is a, uh, a, a progressive disease, autoimmune, meaning your immune system starts attacking self. And in this disease, the antibodies attack the acetylcholine receptors and eliminate the acetylcholine receptors. So what's the clinical symptoms going to be in these individuals? Hyperexcitable, decreased excitability. It's kind of like uh, curare. It blocked the acetylcholine receptors, so even though you had adequate amounts of acetylcholine, the animals don't respond. So this is a, a weakness. These animals present first weak and then become eventually paralyzed. And ultimately, the muscle that, that's going to kill these animals uh, is the, the, the diaphragm. The diaphragm stops, stops functioning, uh, no acetylcholine receptors, and uh, death ensues. Some of these, some of these, disease, organ, uh, some of these disease process or, or chemical problems can be solved with tincture of time. That is, your body can metabolize some of these compounds. The problem is that it may not metabolize them rapidly enough to offset cessation of breathing. So in, in, if, if this were to happen in a human, uh, you would probably put the individual on a respirator. Try to keep them breathing while the body metabolizes. In the case of an autoimmune disease, you need to address the body's autoimmune response. And, and we don't do a particularly good job at that. We tend to we tend to go in and say, all right, I want to I wanna suppress the immune system. Steroids work really well, so we're going to treat these individuals with steroids and hope they recover. 
but as medicine and technology advance, our ability to go in there and deal with these specific toxins is going to be improved. Okay, why don't we take a break?